biggest endeavour. And I think that the paper pay, power pay, progression, justice at work is a really good contribution to the debate. And the polling is really instructive. The ideas around the Fair Work Commission really signal some innovative thinking consistent with what we've done over the last 20 years. So um, I'm here really to give you a readout of where we are with this policy review and really just to invite you into the conversation uh, because it's fairly early days in it and if you get in at the ground floor I think that could be a really fertile conversation uh, which is in our interest and hopefully it can inform some of your work. Um, I think I should basically uh, signal where we are and uh, where we intend to go. And I'll tell you how I sort of look at this, is uh, if you look at the last 120 years in the Labour Party, we've had three great defeats, really, 1931, where I think we've got, including the ILP seats, about 41 seats, um, 1983, where we got 29% of the vote, and two years ago, when we just about got above what we got in 1983. And um, the interesting thing for me is that those three crises for Labour, if you want, empirically, its worst ever defeats come a year or two after a major capitalist crisis and rupture, um, which tells you something, it seems to me, in terms of the capacity of centre-left parties to step up at these moments of crisis and rupture. Um, it shines a light on some of our failures historically. Um, so, that's quite instructive that we've come out of one of the worst defeats in our history, arguably, the worst defeat since 1918, given the fact that in 1983 you could say the SDP were there, which uh, informed some of that defeat in terms of the challenges we faced. We didn't have an equivalent. Um, and at every moment after such periods of rupture, there's major political realignment. So in 1931, there was the national government, 1983, there was the SDP, in 2010, there was the coalition. So periods of major economic and social transformation, there's major political realignment often at the expense of the Labour Party. So that doesn't tell you a very good tale in terms of our capacity to get over the line in a couple of years' time. Um, conversely, there are three great victories in Labour's history, 945, 964, 997, Attlee, Wilson, Blair. And in each of those times, they <coughs> successfully contested the national story, so nine. 45, it was the Conservative Party of the 30s of mass unemployment and appeasement. 1964, it was Alec Douglas Moore, Alec Douglas Hume running around his grouse more, uh, versus Harold Wilson grasping the scientific and technological challenges of the country. And in 1997, it was their economic and social modernisation with Drift, Decline, John Nature, Sweets, etc. So we can do it and form majority periods of Labour government. But he is a kicker for me. 1945 was after 14 years of Labour opposition. 1964 was after 13 years of Labour opposition. 1997 was after 18 years of Labour opposition. So when we leave power, the conclusion is it takes us quite a while to get back in. So, I would conclude we are coming off the back of arguably our worst defeat in our history and it's unprecedented in terms of our capacity to get back in very quickly after we lose power. And we've got 26 months. So we've got to do something we've never done before. That's how I read what the policy challenges are that we need to confront. Um, basically, we better get on with it. Um, I took over this policy review in July, I think it's July. At the time, we had uh, 40 or 45 other different policy groups across our shadow cabinet dealing with all sorts of issues. Arguably, it was pretty random in terms of the priorities. It wasn't coherent in terms of a deeper strategy or story, for example, uh, and uh, this is usually used to symbolise a sort of sense of the lack of direction to it. We did have a group on loneliness that actually was in court and never met. So, <laughs> <laughs> the point being, that there, was, uh, there was an awful lot of uh, work going on, arguably at the expense of a coherent strategy. <laughs> so the first stage was to get rid of those four before five groups and set up three. So we set up three, one on the economy, one on society, one on politics. The next stage was to arguably learn from our history, 45, 64, 97, and put some sort of national frame on it to try and seek to contest that national story. So you might have heard of a phrase called One Nation Labour, which was adopted by the leader at the last conference to try and put that national framework on top, to sort of seal and put a lock on what we're trying to do in terms of one nation society, economy, and politics. 
that was the next step. <coughs> the third step is to acknowledge that we're in a slightly different climate than before, in that we have a fixed term parliament. Right. So usually it's pretty contingent on events of the day. Now we have a sort of timeline for this policy group that's been handed to us by the government. And there's a sort of natural line through it. So beginning of this year to July, this year when the House rises for the summer, the sort of interregnum, and then we have a Labour Party conference. Then we have a period from October this year through to July next year when the House rises for the interregnum, the final Labour Party final conference before the election. 2014, and then we had six months around the back of the 2014 conference to May 2015, the fixed term parliament, the likely date of the general election. What that tells you basically is there's sort of a natural three phases to this cycle of policy development for the party between now and July, first stage, October to July next year, stage two, third phase, six months after the next year's conference. So you've got three phases of policy review. We're just beginning the first phase. So the strategy was to set up the three groups and then give them work plans, timetables, responsibilities, especially for the first phase. And that's what we spent the autumn doing with all of the respective members of our show cabinet. So we've agreed the work programme for the first phase of the policy review, leading to the first cut of this policy review in July. I know this is all process driven, but we had to get the process right and then to you know, start going into more substantive discussions and deliberations about some of the outstanding issues. So, uh, the three subcommittees around economy, society, and politics, first phase till late July this year, the economy group will be covering issues around bank reform, a modern growth agenda, spending, energy policy, vocational skills, supply side policy, railways and buses, Europe and housing. The second group, on social policy, recovery and welfare, immigration, crime and policing, health and adult social care, prison reform, recidivism. And in terms of the politics group, devolution, local government, young people, modern <coughs> political issues, constitutional reform, and the fault line between liberty and security. I'll walk through that because um, it's, I think it's instructive for you to know where we're coming from in terms of the processes and the priority issues that we're seeking to address. Now we're just beginning those cycle of meetings that will pull together the policy on those 20 areas, so that in July we'll have a sort of base camp in terms of policy agenda that will inform the strategy behind the second phase and the third phase. Now it seems to me that there are a number of different organising principles around which this is sort of beginning to cohere. One is the notion of uh, devolution of power the democratic questions at the local level. Second, the question of um, building more resilient, durable, connected communities. Third, prevention rather than cure. And fourth, to build a more resilient economy, given the schools that ricocheted through in 2018 and how we overcome that and create more solid footings in the ground of our economic and social policy. Now that is, to me, a rather different model of social, social democracy to that which inhabited the last Labour government. Because basically, right, we had 13 years of growth on Labour's watch. And that created a model of sort of back-end fiscal <laughs> transfers, where we thought we'd locked in growth and then to boom and bust towards that. And the thinking now is um, moving towards more architectural questions, if you want, much more substantial questions about system design in terms of economic and social policy. That, I think, is significant because it's significant for the involvement of the trade union movement in these discussions. Let me give you a few examples. We're putting front and centre issues of economic and industrial democracy. Now, I would say that Labour hasn't really had that conversation for about 20, 25 years. And that is interesting in terms of how you build more resilient economic architecture, the role of uh, architectural reform in terms of uh, banking, but not just that in terms of board representation, pattern of worker involvement, communication, obligations and duties on corporate citizenship. I think that's a real rich scene for the trade union movement that we could work together very strongly on. As I mentioned, the supply side reforms in terms of education and skills, um, you'll see an awful lot of discussion around um, the forgotten 50% in this conversation. A lot of vocational skills, um, <coughs> apprenticeships. Third, the notion of a modern industrial policy. Uh, the notion of labour and industrial strategy 
uh, has been a sort of on-off relationship for quite a few decades now. And I think you're going to see that centre stage. Now that has real implications in terms of sectoral policy um, and strategic interventions, which I think obviously there's a strong parallel to the strategies of the Trade Union for the New Year's 21 in that discussion. Um, obviously, labour law, family-friendly policy. The question that was raised, I think Dan raised it in terms of the modern European model. Um, the way I look at it is post-45, you had a very basic foundations to the European model, which was a growth model that was there, as well as the notion of peace in Europe, both of which, given the crisis across the Eurozone that's ricocheting around, as well as war on mainstream Europe, the fact that those two central propositions offer diminishing returns, what are the equivalent today to rebuild the pro-European agenda? How any states you invite the people back into that conversation? Um, seems to me that's quite a uh, interesting conversation which I know you'll be very much involved in. The whole question of infrastructure, housing, transport, public services, again, I can see an awful lot of common ground, as I do in terms of any modern energy policy and modern politics, funding, constitutional and political reform. The point I'm making <coughs> is that it seems to me there is more, there is a stronger framework for cooperation and joint policy work than there has been for many years. Um, the question is um, to create the proper processes to get a more durable, ongoing engagement. Um, on running this policy review and basically it's an open invitation to create that discussion to really get to work on these substantive issues. How do we build more resilient communities? How do we build more resilient individuals actually? How do we build a more resilient economy? A modern European policy, a modern industrial policy, a decent fairness of work agenda, energy, sector policy, infrastructure, spending, a more durable economy, it seems to me that it's not beyond our collective wit to see how we can work through this agenda over the next 26 months. It's not, for me, a choice. It's an absolute obligation given what's going on in the country. Thanks very much.